see everyone today. There you are. There's your announcement to the effect. Welcome, everybody. It's so good to see you today. I'm so excited about our program. This is the second in our book club series. I hope that you guys have your trusty book ready. You've highlighted yours like I've been highlighting mine and ready to ask questions of our speakers. So this is an interactive program. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how we're gonna handle the format today. First, I'm gonna start off by introductions. My name is Anissa Mitchell and I'm with PMD Alliance. Um, some of the things that I wanna to note today is that this is a book club discussion. So we're not doing the typical live stream where we just talk at you and then leave it to the end for you to ask questions. We're engaging you from the very beginning. So um, we want you to feel free as we get ready to launch into this to uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, or if you're more comfortable typing it, then you can certainly use the chat feature. So let me go through some housekeeping real quick before we get started. First of all, most of you are experts in Zoom, but just on the off chance that you're still kind of new to navigating this, I want to point out where the chat feature is. So if you hover over your screen, if you are on a computer with your mouse, you'll see at the bottom, the little box sort of in the middle that says chat. If you click that, it'll pop open the sidebar box and that's where you can chat your questions. You might also see that my words are being transcribed. So if you like that, you can keep it. If that makes it simpler for you, you can kind of hover over it if you've updated your Zoom and you can kind of move it around your screen if you like. Um, and if you want to get rid of it, all you have to do is go to where it says closed caption little box live transcript and you can pop open that little box and it'll say hide subtitles and that'll go away. And then if you want it to come back, you can just go there and do the same in reverse. Um, the other thing is if you want to keep this in gallery view where you can see everyone's faces, we love seeing you, um, you can go over to the top right hand corner and you'll see view and it'll give you the option of gallery or speaker view. So whatever you like, whatever's comfortable for you, feel free. And also feel free to give us a shout out like Amy did, letting us know that she actually lived near Camp Lejeune. So I'm sure that's gonna be referenced today. Um, so I'm I want to get started and let you know that um, we have Ted Thompson, who is joining us today. He's a senior vice president of public policy for the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Research. And Ted has done has more than 25 years experience in public policy and government affairs, um, serving nonprofit leadership positions and staff to two members of Congress. So he is an expert in the area of advocacy and what we can do to make a change, which is the focus of today's topic. Um, I know that we covered last time uh, with Dr. Dorsey a little bit of the history of Parkinson's and we learned some things that I didn't know. Like it was very interesting history um, of how we got to where we are in terms of our knowledge of Parkinson's. Um, and then I know Ted talked a little bit or not Ted, I'm sorry, Dr. Dorsey talked a little bit about some of the chemicals that we're gonna be referencing today. Um, but Ted, I know that you're gonna be talking about these from more of a policy perspective. Um, and I think that's really important. So um, I know that you have some slides that we're gonna talk about. Um, and before we, we start sharing those, I wanna talk about, there's a quote at the very beginning of chapter four, and then it, there's another one at the end that I, I think kind of segues really nicely into uh, this topic that you're getting ready to cover from Rachel Carson back in the 60s. And her first quote at the beginning says, how could intelligent beings seek to control a few unwanted species by a method that contaminated the entire environment and brought the threat of disease and death even unto their own kind? Well, that was the second quote. The first one, I'm sorry, I skipped was farmers speak, spoke of much illness among families in towns and doctors become more and more puzzled by new kinds of sickness. So this is very important because we have 
quite a bit of evidence as indicated in this book of what we're dealing with when we talk about things like paraquat, DDT, heptachlor. Um, I know there's more, so I'm going to let Ted start sharing his expertise. And then if you do wanna ask a question um, in person, if you would just be willing to raise your hand either physically, although we can't see everyone, we do have quite a few people on here, but if you could use maybe your emojis at the bottom, that way we wanna make sure we, we wanna make sure we, we don't miss anyone. So Ted, welcome and thank you for joining us. I know you're speaking on behalf of Michael J. Fox Foundation and Ted or Todd Shear. Yes, thanks for having me. And I will confess, I accidentally pushed the wrong button. <laughs> no worries. And so I did that. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much for having me and, uh, and for hosting this. I think it's a great, uh, great way to not only educate, but to interact and learn, um, you know, for myself and, and my team as well, because uh, you all are living with a disease and have had experiences that, um, you know, we need to hear about and know about to effectively do our job. Just real quick, um, I've been with the foundation for a little over five years. That's when we started the public policy department at the foundation. Prior to that, um, policy uh, activities were done through the Parkinson's Action Network that I was CEO of for a couple of years. Um, and I think you all know the foundation has been around for uh, since the year 2000, so this is our 21st year. And uh, uh, the environmental aspects of this disease really haven't been getting a lot of attention um, until recent years. And so uh, the first slide that I want to just show you is to give you a sense of all the different policy activities uh, that we're involved in. Um, so we have essentially three different buckets um, and then a bunch of sub buckets and sub buckets to that because it seems like the number of issues that we are um, addressing or coming across uh, don't don't actually you know fit uh, at least three neat bu buckets, but furthering Parkinson's disease research, supporting therapy development and approvals, and then safeguarding access to care and support services. Um, and one of the buckets under the furthering Parkinson's research are the environmental risk factors, which is what we're here to talk about today based on the book and, and the great work that the authors did uh, compiling the research, the studies, um, you know, the history of it. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Uh, just a brief rundown of what we've been doing in our current efforts. Um, Paraquat is basically the number one uh, environmental aspect that we are targeting currently. Um, in the last Congress, we had a standalone piece of legislation introduced to ban para to, to specifically ban Paraquat. That bill was then incorporated into a much broader pesticide reform bill that um, we expect to be reintroduced in the next couple, couple of months. Uh, so what that bill does is not only does it ban paraquat and ban several other dangerous chemicals, but it would require the EPA to do a new review of all the chemicals that the EU has banned that we still use here. And it reforms the, the overall pesticide um, uh, law to change the, the burden of proof um, so that the burden falls on the manufacturers to prove safety. Because in this country, these things get approved without taking into account the human impact, the way that that is taken into account in other countries. And that's why a lot of countries don't allow a lot of the chemicals to be used in agriculture that we use here. So the, uh, that's the legislative effort. Um, administratively, uh, the chemical paraquat was up for what's called re-registration with the EPA. It's a process that happens every 15 years and the EPA collects information from you know, the public uh, and the manufacturers, of course, um, about these different chemicals. So we had put together a joint letter with the Unified Parkinson's Advocacy Council, which PMB Alliance is a part of that. And we had petitioned the EPA with a very strong scientifically um, uh, based, with peer reviewed articles, uh, argument as to why paraquat should be banned and why the connection to Parkinson's is so strong. We also kicked off a petition on change.org that I think when we submitted it, we had about 107,000 signatures. And then the intervening couple of years, another eight or 10,000 people have signed it. So there's great public interest in this as well. In fact, change.org told us there aren't many petitions that get 100,000. 
Um, so we feel that we've got very compelling, not only evidence-based uh, information to support a ban, but the public wants it as well. So, you know, we petitioned the EPA at the end of uh, last year before the new administration came in, the EPA did decide to re-register Paraquat. So it's still on the market and it will be for the foreseeable future. Um, but that doesn't mean we're going to stop. We're going to still be pushing both legislatively and administratively. Um, one area that we um, are, are focusing on in, in the United States is actually California. We don't typically do state public policy, but we've got a um, situation in California, the biggest state in the country. If we could get a ban there, we think that that could start a snowball effect and get other states to pay attention and ban it. So we're actually, we have a bill ready to be introduced uh, in January, I believe, to ban it, but we're also talking with the California EPA about that. And the governor of California submitted a, a budget proposal this year that would tax the toxicity of chemicals. So the higher the toxicity, the higher the tax. And Paraquat is at that high end. And they're not doing the tax just for revenues, they're doing it to try and get farmers to switch to different farming practices and the money would actually be used to help the farmers do that. Because one thing that you know we're aware of is this is a significant tool in the toolbox for the farming community. And to just ban it without doing anything to help those farmers convert to different types of farming practices could be devastating for them. And so you know we prefer to develop a carrot and a stick approach. Um, and so having, in this case, California, have a pool of money to help farmers convert to better to different safer farming practices we think could go a long way to mitigate any economic impact at the federal level um, you wouldn't think that a parkinson's organization would get involved in the farm bill but the farm bill comes up every five or six years and it's coming up again i think in 2022 but so we're going to be looking at how can we use farming policy to create incentives and disincentives around Paraquat. Um, one of the most successful programs that the federal government ever put in uh, affecting agriculture, it's called the Conservation Reserve Program. It has, it, it has nothing to do with farming other than the government paid farmers to take farmland that, was that had typically been used by game birds for, you know, living in reproduction and everything to take the, that farm out of farming so that the game bird population can have a chance to repopulate because back in the 70s and early 80s the, the game bird populations were way down um, so anyway they congress implemented this pr program and it was phenomenally successful so it's a an, it's an example of how federal policy can uh, can uh, affect you know the practices of the farmers and, and of the public obviously uh, so that we're going to be looking at that as another federal strategy. Um, other efforts, uh, the National Institutes of Health, one of its institutes is the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Uh, they're the ones that would do the research around things like Paraquat or TCE uh, and the impact on human, on human lives. So we've uh, already, well, we've had an engagement strategy with them but we've kicked it up a, a couple of notches and we've met with the new, relatively new director there and he's very interested in engaging more and we are working with an ad hoc group of environmental experts to develop a, uh, an environmental plan of action for the NIEHS so that they have, um, you know, they, in order to basically chart the research path for them. So that's something that we're doing um, with NIEHS. There's a program, the only, Parkinson specific research program in the entire federal government is at the Department of Defense. And it's actually uh, called the Neurotoxin Exposure uh, Parkinson's Program. And so the De Defense Department research funding goes toward essentially environmental exposures. Because servicemen and women are exposed to chemicals and toxins, burn pits, all sorts of things that the rest of us aren't. And so that uh, is specifically an environmentally focused research program. Um, earlier this year, we kicked off uh, additional research grants 
um, around exposures during military service, uh, profiles of ge geographic Parkinson's clusters, uh, influence of today's pesticides on disease, and uh, there's increasing information about uh, or evidence about air pollution's impact as a trigger for Parkinson's. Uh, so we've got a broad-based policy and research agenda um, tr uh, trying to address the environmental aspects of Parkinson's. Uh, Camp Lejeune was mentioned that is one of the successes in re recent years where um, if you served at Camp Lejeune, served or lived at Camp Lejeune for a 30-day period, consecutive or non-consecutive, during a period of about 20, 25 years, you automatically are uh, eligible for disability because of all the contaminated water. And um, I mean, Parkinson's is just one of a number of diseases uh, that have come from that uh, water, uh, the, the toxic water that they were exposed to. Then I think it was two years ago, um, Agent Orange coverage uh, as a disability was extended to uh, people who served in the Navy uh, out, uh, within a certain radius of Vietnam, um, because originally it was only for people that were on the ground without the recognition that this Agent Orange, you know, carried into the air and exposed sailors and, uh, you know, people in the Navy. Uh, and then finally, uh, Parkinsonisms was recently added as, um, a service-connected disability at the VA as well. We've been fighting for that for several years, and so that was a, a recent success as well. Um, let's see. Yeah, we'll, we'll do this, and then we can open it up. I'm not going to read this, um, but one of the triggers we have um, at our disposal to try and get increased research funding isn't necessarily a line item with a dollar amount, but it's what's called congressional report language. When they pass the annual appropriations bills, there's a report that the committee sends with the bill. And in the report is language from the committee essentially telling the, the agency how to spend their money. Um, not, as, not necessarily dollar amounts, but you know, this a sense of the Congress that we want you to do more. And so we put this what we think is very comprehensive language together, urging NIEHS to um, really dig into the genetic and environmental factors. We highlight uh, herbicides, pesticides, heavy metals. Uh, one of the other things that we've um, started to notice is that first responders, like firefighters, tend to have a higher prevalence of Parkinson's. But there, were, to my knowledge, there's only really been one study done about that. And so we and we had talked about this at our meeting with the NIEHS a while back, um, but we think that this language here, which the agency actually reviewed and strengthens, they're all in favor of this. Um, so we're not fighting with the agency to get them to do something that they don't wanna do, which is nice, they wanna be a partner. Um, but we, we think that this could do a, a lot to get NIEHS more um, specifically focused on Parkinson's triggers. So that's all that I have in terms of formally talking about our agenda. Well, um, that's a lot. I mean, you guys are doing a lot, but there's a lot to consider. Um, and, you know, of course, my my first gut reaction to this is what is wrong with the EPA? <laughs> you know, how could they not see all of the evidence? And there was a quote in the book, this, it's the most highly acutely toxic herbicide to be marketed over the last 60 years. I mean, we know that these are problems, but I didn't, you know, when you're, as you're talking about, well, you know, if you ban these things, then that causes hardship with the farmers. And then there's a huge trickle down effect. So it's like so multifaceted of consideration. And, and we've got quite a few questions that's, that's really good. I, I'm, concerned we're not so much concerned but wondering like we're looking at this as you know a much broader issue and i know that climate change is such a huge issue so climate change isn't just a an environmental issue it's a human issue so are they kind of putting these together now is are they looking at it as a bigger picture in that regard um well i hate to be a, a truth teller here but Congress isn't much interested in 
dealing with climate change. A lot of members are, but not enough members to actually do something. Um, and, and I won't pretend that us attempting a legislative ban on paraquat is going to be easy. It's not. Um, it, it, you know, could be very, um, it, it could take man, many years to get something done at the federal level. That's why we have started to shift our strategy to the state level. Um, but states, you know, they are the incubators of democracy, really, because they uh, are able to do things uh, much more quickly than the federal government. Um, you know, we, um, uh, in terms of, you know, the part of the paraquat and climate change, though, um, yeah, you're right. I mean, climate change is impacting human health. And I mean, all you have to do is watch the news to see uh, the severe drought uh, out, out west, the fire, you know, the fires that will be coming, the um, lack of water. I mean, they've got a water crisis there. Um, and it's all due to climate change. But things like paraquat, um, you know, contributes uh, from the standpoint of, um, I mean, the farming practices, for example, um, there are ways with pest management and other types of farming practices that would enable farmers to not use this chemical. And uh, e even though it's known to be as, as dangerous as it is, it's the use of paraquat has gone up significantly in recent years. All right, we had a question and I will just remind everyone, if you do want to ask directly, just raise your hand, notify us, maybe through chat, um, use the reactions at the bottom to do like a hand up that you want to uh, ask a question. I'll go through some of the ones that's come through the chat. So um, somebody wanted a clarification. The understanding is that herbicides are considered pesticides. Can you, can you cl clarify that? Um, well, herbicides are directed toward basically weeds and pesticides toward pests and you know, ants and things like that. So that's, that's the difference. Um, uh, and there are other types of sides, you know, and fungicides and, and things like that. Um, technically, paraquat is an herbicide, um, but we, we don't, um, you know, split hairs on, on this because we're basically talking about eliminating chemicals in the environment that are known triggers for Parkinson's. Um, I think you mentioned TCE earlier. Um, and the, you know, the book uh, really does a great job detailing the, the science and the evidence behind these chemicals and the, and the connection. Um, two states have banned TCA, uh, TCE. Um, Minnesota and New York have both banned TCE. So we're hopeful that there could be a state-by-state -state effort uh, on that as well. And I, I do wanna get into the, the super funds because those are related to TCE, correct? Um, and I know some people that lived, I know they referenced the, uh, the lady who lived in California near Silicon Valley and she had to have whole home remediation so that she could continue to live there. So I wanna get into some of these questions, but I do think this is related. Can you talk a minute about super funds? And I looked it up, there's one in my town. So I'm curious a little about this. Yeah. Um... The Superfund, you don't hear much about it anymore. Um, I remember when I was you know, in college and law school hearing a lot about it. And then when I was in law school, I actually worked for a congressman whose main priority was the environment. So he was actually involved in the Superfund uh, legislation and the Clean Air Act amendments. And back then there was something that was called acid rain where pollutants would get into the air and float over and, you know, get rained on in other parts of the country or the world. So the Superfund sites uh, were created as part of a law um, that finally recognized the severe damage that we had done to our environment um, and oftentimes near where people lived. And so um, the Superfund law essentially requires the, the people or the companies that made the mess to clean it up. And if they don't do it, the government will do it but they'll make those companies pay for it. So in a nutshell, that's what that does. Um, and I don't have statistics on how many sites have been fully cleaned versus partially cleaned, um, but they do still continue to add new sites onto the Superfund list. Um, and if you just Google Superfund, I mean, if you Google Superfund and your state name, 
you'll get a list of all the super fun sites in your state um, and often you know by, by city as well so that's i mean in a nutshell that's what the super fund law does is requires those uh, contaminated areas to be cleaned up um, to, to the point that you could use land for you know human purposes well in the book talk too about a lot of silicon valley you know these major companies that have become household names you know are all in and around superfund sites and there's a lot of them which is the scary thing all right we did have ellen shaper wanted to ask a question so ellen if you want to unmute yourself then you can go ahead Hi there, thank you. <laughs> Save me finishing my typing. Thank you so much for this really smartly focused campaign. It's just a joy to uh, understand the level of strategy and tactics and knowledge of Congress that's really gone into this campaign. And I really, I'm reading the book and I appreciate that as well. I want to ask you though, um, in terms of focusing so much on Paraquat, I understand the political reason for doing that right now, and also the solvents. Um, I live in San Francisco now, so hopefully I can help with California politics, but I grew up in Freeport, Long Island, and we were out there every weekend killing weeds and putting pesticide all over the place. My brother, I'm 72 now, I have PD. My brother is three years younger. He reminds me that he and his friends used to chase after the DDT trucks, that they were spraying the whole neighborhood to get rid of the mosquitoes so they could build the suburbs. And they were out there breathing that stuff in. He's had kidney cancer. They had a kidney removed, he's okay. My mother died of it in 1985. So I'm just hoping, wondering, you know, I think it's great to be looking into agricultural pesticides. I mean, you got to do things in some order that makes sense, but I'm really curious about the various other things that we have been assaulted with and wonder if there's some way to make that more visible. No, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. And you're right, you know, we have to start somewhere and, and we felt that Paraquat, given that it's banned in, you know, over 30 countries, the entire EU, China, it's banned in, uh, I think Thailand is the most recent country to ban it. You know, we felt it was the most compelling argument right now, um, based on all that attention. But you're absolutely right. I mean, DDT, PCE, um, uh, uh, trichloroethylene, there's so many other, and I think how I feel about it is this is, I mean, it's 2021 and it's amazing to think that this is kind of the awake, a, a new awakening of, envir of an environmental movement. Um, you know, it's great to protect the fish and the birds and the, you know, the, you know, the unique animals that are about to go extinct, but we should also think about protecting humans. And I don't think that, and I'm not criticizing the environmental groups, don't take this wrong. From a policymaking standpoint, I just don't think that policymakers have been focused enough on the human, the impact on human lives of a lot of these chemicals. Um, and you know, I'm actually really excited about the prospects in California. Um, and I do know, after talking to a lot of advocates from around the country, that a lot of folks like you want to take up arms at the state level um, and and try to get a ban there. So. We are actually working on a toolkit so that um, because we you know we don't have people in every state in terms of a, a lobbying presence or anything, um, but there are certain policy initiatives like this that I mean it's not it's not brain surgery I mean exposure to this chemical scientific ev evidence that it triggered the Parkinson's and cancers and all sorts of other things. Um, uh, but it's for you to be able to go to your legislators and say hey. This is awful stuff. It should be banned. Um, so <laughs> I'm with you in spirit that we gotta we have to do a lot more because there are a lot more chemicals out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I feel that I mean, most, I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I bet if I did ask for a show of hands and I asked how many people here have ever heard of 
the National Institute on Environmental Health Sciences, almost no hands would go up. It's not a well-known uh, agency or institute at the NIH, um, but I think that it, it could do so much to answer so many of these questions and really alter life you know, in the United States for the better. So my hope is that we're at the, at the beginning of a much broader awakening around, around these issues. Thank you, hope so. So um, we have a couple people that have a question. So Cindy has a question I think goes along with what you were just saying. And then we have Joanne and then I'll come to some that came through the chat. So let's start with Cindy Bitker, if I'm saying your name right. Is she on mute? I don't know. Are you still there? Can you unmute yourself, Cindy? If you still want to ask I'm, your question. I do. I'm sorry. I was on mute. Hi, Ted. Hi. This could be a hard, I know, I know Cindy, so this might be a hard question for me. That was a really easy question. It's not even a question. It's an, it's a, it's an easy to do. For uh, many years, I worked with Ted on a pan and doing legislative advocacy and going into Washington, D.C. And after all those years with Zoom and, um, you know, the pandemic, I have found that it is so much more effective and easier to advocate from your armchair than it was ever brought around the halls of Congress. Um, when I had been doing work with Pan, I got to know Joe Kennedy very well. And when, when Trump came into office, I was pretty, everyone was pretty disheartened. How is anything ever going to happen anymore at this point? You know, we can just hang it up. And he said to me that, um, he said, first of all, the only thing any politician cares about at all is your vote. That's it. Bottom line, they care about your vote. And, and if you are you know, one of their constituents and you vote, that's your power. It doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter if you're in Washington, D.C. or wherever. If you, if you vote, you have, you've got to take it in. And um, that's true. I mean, I, I have so, so much more access to him locally and his staff than I ever did going into um, Washington, D.C. And bottom line, when you call an, an office, a local office, and you tell them I live in the Boston area, and you know how, approximately how many people Parkinson's are with, in their constituency, in their district, that matters. Um, all that matters is numbers and votes. So the, the other thing I was, um, in, investment-wise, I tried to invest in farmland, and I ended up investing in a, a REIT that, that buys farms and tries to convert, you know, um, their, their goal is 90% of them to be organic. And there are other kind of off the path ways to support farmers that are trying to make those changes. But um, bottom line is efficacy is easier than it ever was <laughs> and um, really effective and, and really satisfying. So I would like to know more about what is going on at a state level that we can do. Um, and, and I will say that even without a, a bill or anything to call or make a, um, or, uh, you know, an ask or a particular thing to call about. If you just call your representatives and say, I have Parkinson's, I have, you know, 20 friends in my community with Parkinson's, we're really worried about, you know, this situation and, and the links to this. They will also get involved in looking into it for you and just they'll become more involved in it. They really, um, they just need to know that we're there and that uh, you know, we make a connection. And, uh, yeah. You're making a really good point. I think a lot of people feel uh, helpless uh, in terms of, you know, my voice isn't going to matter. They're not going to pay attention. And that may be true for one voice, but the collective voice is what really has the impact. I mean, a lot of people point toward Alzheimer's and uh, AIDS activists. And they, well, the reason they've been successful is they've united with a voice. And, you know, you can't, a public official can't go to a public meeting and not have Alzheimer's come up. It, and it, they don't necessarily have an ask. Like Cindy said, you don't necessarily need an ask. It can just be as simple as I have Parkinson's, my father has Parkinson's, you know, this is affecting our lives in these ways. You've got to do more to try and find treatments and a cure for Parkinson's. You know, because the more they hear it, the more their, you know, their antenna is up for when something does come across their desk um, or their congressional staff. Um, and yeah, the coming to Washington, D.C., um, it, it's, it's an event. It's something to do. It's awesome. you've never done it. You know, it's, it's great. But it isn't necessarily the most effective means of connecting with your lawmaker. Um, having worked both in Washington and at a state, um, the congressional office based in the state, 
you know, when the congressman was in town and he'd have meetings in the state office, they weren't rushed. He wasn't being pulled out for, for votes. He wasn't being pulled out to take a picture with a constituent. You know, he was there. And instead of getting five minutes of his time, you get 20 or 25 minutes of his time. And so the meeting with your legislators when they're back in the state is a really great strategy. Um, and another thing is, you know, whether you like your congressmen or senators or not, sign up for their emails so that you know when they're having public meetings. Um, and we, you know, I'm not going to get into an advocacy training here, but um, yeah, because we do, we do have that. So people that are interested should certainly connect with us. But um, uh, yeah, the ability to impact your, get your legislators to pay attention. It can happen in DC, but oftentimes that is just such a crazed schedule that it's hard to really get them to focus. Yeah. Um, I, I only, I saw something on the chat pop up about chemical lobbyists and I didn't read the whole thing, but um, one thing I'll point out is, you know, we don't have an army of lobbyists like the chemical companies. We also don't have pack checks and we don't have, you know, hundreds of executives that can write personal checks for the maximum amount to these people, to these elected officials. So our power comes from our stories and from the numbers of people we can generate to take action. And it doesn't have to only be a Parkinson's patient or their caregiver. Because any of you who have children or have doctors you see or nurses that you see, you know, Parkinson's, you know, for every one person that has it, you know, it affects five, six, 10 other people because you've got your, your family that's impacted, you've got the social services, the healthcare system, et cetera. Um, and, you know, we did an economic burden study a couple of years ago based on 2017 data, uh, the economic burden for the United States is estimated to be around $52 billion a year. And by 2037, which is only 16 years from now, the cicadas will almost be ready to come back out. Uh, just got rid of the last ones. Um, it's projected to be almost $80 billion. And half of that is paid for by the federal government because 90% of Parkinson's patients are on Medicare. So the federal government is footing the bill to a huge dollar amount. Um, and to put it in perspective, you know, the feds are spending about $25 billion a year caring for people with Parkinson's. And they're spending $240 million a year researching it. So you know, they, they spend more in three and a half days on caring for Parkinson's patients than they do in researching the disease. So that too is you know, part of the message that, that we're focused on to get lawmakers to pay. Because you know, oftentimes if you can't get them with the fact that this is a horrible disease and people shouldn't have it, you know, hit them in the pocketbook and say, you can save a boatload of money if we could find, you know, even if we could slow the progression and keep people in the workforce longer and off disability longer, that would have an impact, for example. Absolutely. I think Joanne had a question. She's been very patient with her hand raised. So go ahead, Joanne. Yesterday, uh, I heard a presentation on how um, the process that was used to get Quebec to list Parkinson's as an occupational um, disease or an occupational issue, uh, which certainly has a lot of impact for people who have Parkinson's if their government calls it an occupational something, and I think you could get a lot of support then for your treatment, whatever. But the, the process that they used was, was interesting and follows along with some of the things that were just being spoken. Uh, the thing they said that they didn't think was very uh, helpful and successful was sticking with the science. They had tremendous science, they had studies, they had tons of data and information uh, position papers and all that sort of stuff. But they said that wasn't nearly as influential as it was with the politicians meeting their people. Now, they did it in a way that may be extremely difficult for us because we have so much, you know, our agricultural area is so large. But what they seemed to be doing was helping farmers understand the relationship between chemicals and pesticides and the prevalence of Parkinson's. 
And I'm now in a farming community. And I can tell you, if you go to the local coffee shop at six o'clock in the morning, there are lots of guys around the table whose hands are shaking. So what they found was very influential was helping the farmers understand the relationship and then taking the politicians to the farmers, taking the politicians to their constituents and their constituents then knew that they had things they wanted to say to their politicians. And they found that that was extremely effective. The other thing that I gathered from, from that two or three year, maybe four year focus uh, was that um, they certainly built alliances and they built alliances with groups that would not be, in our case, would not be related to Parkinson's at all. They built alliances with groups that were maybe cancer groups or other groups that also were very concerned about relationship between chemicals, pesticides, whatever, and the diseases that they're supporting and looking for um, money to work on cures or that sort of thing. Uh, Quebec is certainly much, much smaller and, and to you know, scale this all up uh, would be perhaps bigger than we can do, but it's, it's more than us staying at home and calling in or going to a meeting. It's us thinking about how we can impact, how we can bring information to a much larger group of people who we know are being affected by pesticides and then get them to speak as a voice uh, you know, to politicians. Seemed interesting, challenging. Yeah. yeah, and Brittany from my team was on that call and uh, we haven't had a chance to talk in depth about, about that Quebec example, but yeah, we're very intrigued by it. Uh, we haven't uh, considered OSHA as a possibility. Uh, in terms of what you're talking about, though, getting building a, a broader coalition, that is something that we we have done and continue to do um, on, on this and other issues. Because you're right, I mean, we're focused on paraquat because of Parkinson's, but there are a number of cancers that come uh, that are associated with paraquat and, and many other health issues. So, um, you know, so we broadened it uh, in terms of you know, additional health organizations, but then also a lot of the traditional um, environmental organizations, um, you know, Pesticide Action Network, uh, Earth Justice, uh, uh, National Resources Defense uh, Council. Uh, there's a number of um, environmental organizations that are uh, heavily engaged in this as well. Interesting, we good work. Sorry about that. We did have an earlier question, which, you may have kind of touched on, but uh, this person wanted to know if there's anything that can be learned from the process of getting DDT banned be applied to banning other, what they call dastardly chemicals. And I love that word. <laughs> um, I, yes, I, I, the short answer is probably yes, but I'm not an expert on what happened with DDT. So I can't, um, can't really reflect on it uh, other than to say that, you know, looking at that, as an example, um, because th th this is one of those things I think like DDT where the day will come when it's banned and then a generation later, people are gonna be looking back saying, what on earth happened? How could that have remained on the market for so long? You know, And the fact that, I mean, I think if you break out the EU countries into their individual countries, you know, it's, it's like 55 countries around the globe out of what 190 have banned it. You know, and now I, I was part of a meeting with the World Health Organization about a month ago, and this was a primary topic there, um, uh, Paraquat, and then TC and several others. But one of the points that was made, um, and it was kind of looking at the, the wealthier countries versus the not so wealthy countries, uh, but one of the points that was made around Paraquat and other pesticides and herbicides is a lot, a lot of countries actually have a, um, you know, food security is an issue unlike anything we can understand. And so it, you know, as hard as, as it is for us to flip a switch and get a ban, some of these other countries would probably be, you know, very um, unwilling uh, because of the food security issues. And so, you know, so that's, you know, 
and we're, we're not working globally on trying to get this banned other than possibly through the WHO. Um, but it was interesting to hear some other perspectives uh, from around the world. And another person kind of followed up because, you know, we talk about pesticides and herbicides. And, and this person said that they've even been corrected that herbicides aren't considered contributing to Parkinson's because they aren't pesticides. Um, I don't know where that person would have gotten that impression. I mean, pest, again, sometimes pesticides. Yeah, lack of understanding just in the general population. Yeah, I mean, pesticides kills um, pests and herbicides kills weeds. And they're both used on our crops other than organic farming every day, of the, you know, every day of the week. And anything that is formulated to kill something else is likely to be dangerous to humans. I mean, there's no chemical that, I mean, you may not die from certain chemicals that you ingest or that you're exposed to. Um, but even, I mean, some, I saw some reference to Roundup, which is a different chemical than Paraquat, but Roundup and this massive settlement against them because of all the uh, health problems associated with use of Roundup, you know, I'm sure a lot of us have used Roundup in our yard, not thinking anything of it and not even, can, not definitely not thinking, oh, I should wear a mask or gloves or something. Cause if it's being sold at, you know, Walmart and at, at Home Depot, it, it must be safe. Um, and, and that too is I think where our government has fallen down is allowing products to be out there for such a long time without really doing the research and uh, knowing the impact on human life. And there's been a couple of comments and questions surrounding lawn services. Um, do you have anything to say about that in terms of uh, danger, exposure? Well, I know that Brittany- op op Options, maybe, you know, not being so worried about a manicured lawn. <laughs> yeah, um, I, Brittany is on this call and she can chat me separately if she has anything for me to, to convey. Um, but, but I think about that myself. You know, I see all these lawn services around and and thinking, you know, sometimes they have some protective gear. Um, most times they don't, it seems. And um, I don't know that we've, I don't know if any studies have been done around uh, prevalence of Parkinson's in people who do lawn service work, but that's, it's a good flag. It's something that we should look at to see if, and that could be part of that report language I shared. You know, that's, I mean, it, it, it'll, be approved the way it's written, but it's written broadly enough that things like people who, um, you know, work in pest control and lawn services and stuff, um, you know, we could urge the NIEHS to study that as well. Yeah, and of course that, so someone mentioned, Carol mentioned golf courses. So they spray on, the, obviously on the golf courses to keep them perfect. All right, did anybody want to ask any direct questions? Susan has a question. You have to unmute though, we can't hear you. Okay, um, Ted, Barb Matheny here. Um, she and I are the ones who emailed you from Findlay, Ohio. We live in an area that not Findlay itself, but surrounding us is very agricultural. And we also have evidence of different properties in Finley where trichloroethylene was dumped and thus caused um, the EPA to come in and so on. Is there as much scientific evidence for TCE as there is for Paraquat that it could be a trigger for Parkinson's? And we're also finding, I don't know if there's really any connection. We're working with Dr. Dorsey himself. We had a Zoom meeting with him and Dan Kin, who's a lawyer who works in an office building where several lawyers have developed Parkinson's because they're next to a dry cleaners and TCE being a solvent, they believe has maybe the vapor intrusion gotten in there and caused these people to get it. Um, so my question also is in Finley, they used to drill for oil and we have a lot, tons of oil wells underneath the ground. And I taught at 
Finley High School where five people have Parkinson's, some have ALS, some have had glioblastoma. And we recently found out that there's a ban an abandoned well underneath that wasn't capped until 1962. Um, and other teachers who have done research on this said it is a dumping ground. So I guess her question, because Barb and I have been focusing on the TCE, um, so your thoughts? <laughs> well, from a, uh, I am a policy person. I'm not a scientist and I'm not a right. doctor, so I can't give that kind of an answer. But from a policy perspective, I think that there is a very strong correlation that should be taken under consideration by policymakers. Um, I mentioned that Minnesota and New York have both banned TCE. I don't know exactly what prompted them to do that. We were not involved in it. Um, but that at least it shows there's a, an increasing recognition about the danger of TCE. Um, but things like you know exposed wells that haven't been capped. And um, one thing I'll mention, it's, it's related and not related to this, but one of the policy areas that we are very focused on is uh, at the state level is the creation of state Parkinson's registries. They're up and running in California, uh, Utah, Nebraska. I'm working with an Ohio state senator right now um, who um, I haven't had a chance to update you, but he gave a testimony about the bill last week and it'll probably, um, they may take action in the fall because they take the summer off um, in Massachusetts. One of the reasons the registries are so important to us is it's gonna collect data about the Parkinson's patient, but it can also collect data on where people live, where they where they've worked, you know, and and start to compile a lot of information, getting to exactly you know what what you're talking about, um, because there, and and once we have you know population you know entire state population information, it also starts to identify where the clusters are, and big surprise here, a lot of the clusters tend to be in farm communities. Um, but yeah, the TCE with dry cleaners, uh, metal shops, um, TCE has been used, you know, very liberally. So, um, but, but again, it's an example of where I don't think comprehensive research has been done to be definitive. Um, I think enough research has been done that we should take action. But I think the government hasn't really put its arms around all of this. You've, you might have heard of something called forever chemicals, the PFAS chemicals. Um, there are, chem they, and I, you can't ask me a lot of questions other than the point I'm gonna make is uh, there was an effort underway for those to be banned um, by the Obama administration. Uh, and then the new administration came in and, and stopped all of that effort. I think the Biden administration will probably start that again but they, they're called forever chemicals because they get into the ground and they never leave. You know, they're there for generations. Um, and, you know, and I, I will say um, a lot of why we have these problems was based on not necessarily malice, but ignorance. I mean, my, my dad was in the chemical business selling plating chemicals and equipment for in, industrial purposes. And, you know, he would tell me, that when he first got in the business, you know, back in the 50s, I suppose, you know, people would use their chemicals, then they take it out to the dirt parking lot and just dump the chemicals in the ground because they didn't know better. And, um, you know, so, and that's one of the reasons you have Superfund sites all over the place. Um, but it, uh, it was so much based on ignorance. And the reality is we don't need to be ignorant anymore. We've got the data, we've got the evidence, we've got the ability to test things. Um, and it just seems like we are a generation or two behind the times in terms of addressing uh, these types of issues and studying and, and taking action. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and Ted, there's, there's people wanting to know, you know how, how they can get more involved, you know, Ken's wanting to know, he would like to have a PD registry, registry in Oregon. How do he get that started? What are some other ways the PD community can get more involved? Um, on the registry issue, um, we are, I'm hoping that like we're working on a Paraquat toolkit, I wanna to put together a registry toolkit. Um, 
but one of the things with with advocacy is there are a couple of really important first steps that that you need to get right if you're going to have any success. For example, you need the right members of the legislature to take on your cause. If you pick somebody that is, you know, far left or far right or does nothing but you know, offend people, you know, that's probably not the right person to, to lead you across the finish line. So as we put together these toolkits, we're also going to be doing trainings and talking through things like that. Um, so that because sometimes you only get one shot at it. And so if you're going to go into Oregon, but you pick the wrong person, you know, your one shot might be over. Um, uh, but but so the registries are uh, an important priority for us. Uh, so we, you know, we can talk about that offline. Um, I do have a model bill that I've created for the registry that we've actually used for the Ohio version and one that's um, in Ma that we're working on in Massachusetts as well. Um, so I've got that. Um, uh, in terms of broader involvement though, uh, on the screens, um, there is a URL on how to get involved. It's michaeljfox.org slash advocacy. That's the best first place to go to sign up. So you start getting you know, more of our information. Um, our website, michaeljfox.org, we've got an entire section on our policy priorities. Um, if you go there right now, you're not gonna see uh, an action alert for Paraquat, um, only because the bill has not been introduced yet. Um, but we are planning a, a, a broad public campaign uh, around the new paraquat legislation or the pesticide legislation that bans paraquat. Um, uh, uh, so those are two steps you can take. But like I said, sign up for your elected officials emails so that you know when they're having public meetings. And you know this can apply to any level of government, you know, city, state, county, um, and, and federal. Uh, the more you educate people. And the other thing you'll find which is extremely helpful to us to know. Um, but one of the first things you tend to ask when you're meeting with an elected official is, do you know anything about Parkinson's? And if they don't, you can give them you know, the, the 30 second summary. But if they do, it's typically because they're gonna be like, yeah, my grandpa had it. I watched him you know, suffer for all these years. Or you'll find new connections and new natural allies for the cause. Um, and so you know, the more you talk about it with, public officials, not only um, the more support you're gonna get, but you're gonna find more and more connections to the disease. So okay, we, we only have a couple more minutes. And I do want to announce that um, when you join in this program today, you were entered into a drawing to win signed copies of our book, the, the book that we are discussing. Um, here we go. So our winners today is Joan Lincoln and John Flanagan. So if you are on, Kelly's going to be reaching out to you to get your information. These will be sent directly to you. Um, I think we have time maybe for one last question. And I think Barb was the one that had her hand up first. Hey. Hello. Hi, Ted. It's great to see you, even though it's through Zoom. Um, my concern and, and question deals with when you have these brownfields or Superfund sites, EPA comes in, is involved in the cleanup. With these chemicals having such long lives, how is there a policy or how are they determined to be safe? down the road to be built on again without that contamination that still I feel is there and to protect people who might possibly be considering using that land for something else? Uh, that's a good question that off the top of my head, I don't know the answer to. Um, I, I, you know, there, I, I know there's a process, you know, to, uh, to prove that it's, you know, safe and everything like that, but I, I don't know the details on it. Um, but I think you're, you know, you're, you're getting to a good question. You know, what if, uh, I, I'm, I'm from Minnesota and there's a Twin Cities Army ammunition plant that has sat vacant for like 30 years. And when I worked for the first member of Congress that I worked for starting in the late 80s, we were working on that issue back then. 
and and now in 2021 they still haven't finalized the cleanup so that it can be redeveloped and so even once identified and the cleanup starts it can take decades um but you know would you want to start having a young family on top of a former superfund site you know i don't know and well that's it brings a different issue there are the disclosures for that type of thing but um uh, it's a good question. I don't have a definitive answer on that, though. That's my mission right now. Am yes. I, so, yeah, that's where I'm, and Susan, along with me, um, are focusing our efforts. So hopefully right. we'll be able to make a difference and prevent that from happening. Right, right. And I'll, uh, I'll close out, uh, use the word prevent. And that's what this is all about. Um, it's about preventing future Parkinson's cases. Now, some people, you know, on calls like this have said, well, it doesn't, it's not going to impact me, so I don't care. Well, uh, you know, in addition to prevention, though, what we could find because of the information we collect either through registries or through other research is, you know, even if you have Parkinson's today, you know, if we ban some of these things and the research, the research could lead us toward treatments for your Parkinson's today. You know, it's not a promise or anything. It's not a straight line, but you know, we know of these triggers, we should get rid of these triggers as a first step to prevent further Parkinson's. Um, but then, you know, the research that is ongoing around a lot of these things could lead to breakthroughs, you know, that we don't even know what they are. Yet. Thank you. And thanks for all that you're doing. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. And I'm happy to come back for another, another session at some point if folks want. This has been awesome. It's been a great dialogue. Um, I want you guys to join us again on Friday because Dr. Oaken is going to be continuing the conversation as we cover the next chapters. So we look forward to seeing you all then. And Ted, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and for all that you guys are doing to, to advocate for everybody out there and banning this stuff um, and even research. So if everyone would just give him the wave of gratitude, we will wish him well. We thank you for joining us. I will see you all again on Friday for the next section of our book club. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.